and we are live. It is 6 p.m. here on the East Coast, and it's Tuesday, so it's time for Alpha Centers. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Let's make sure everything's actually working. Free stream says we're good. Go on YouTube here. YouTube says we're good. All right, excellent. So we are live. We're streaming across the interwebs. And this is Office Hours Q&A. So, um, you know, ever since I redid my layout, the Office Hours, like, text is underneath my head. So nobody can see it. But <laughs> trust me, it's there. This is where we do uh, answers to your questions uh, about all things tax. You know, we can throw in some business stuff, some economics every now and then. Tax people have questions about taxes. I'm your host, Neil. This is Serena. She is our ops uh, person, our manager of all the things. And mm -hmm. she's got a bunch of questions that have come in over the last week or so, and uh, I have no idea what they are. So that's that's fun. Uh, but let's dive in for a second. So this is me. I actually, uh, I got new headshots done last week. So this picture <laughs> will be replaced with something a little bit more up to date. Uh, the uh, photographer was like, yeah, I was looking at your website and I didn't see much gray, you know, in your, your view. There's just a little bit in this picture, but um, yeah, it's definitely accelerated. I, I'm actually uh, skipping gray. I'm going straight to white. That's just how it's working with my particular genetics. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so who am I? Uh, what is Tech Sherpa? And uh, I found out early on that the corporate world was not for me. And so I spent my 20s doing a whole bunch of different stuff, some, you know, entrepreneurial activities. And then in 2007, I started getting letters from the IRS saying I owed them $1.3 million, which was a problem. And like most people, I ignored the problem and it got worse and worse. And then by 2009, they were garnishing my paycheck. So at that point, I decided I had to fix my problems. So I went ahead and did that. And in doing so, I hooked up with the person who ended up becoming my mentor in the tax world. He's a former, former Wall Street tax attorney. And he helped me fix my problems and I helped him fix his business. So over the next few years, I worked with him and I, uh, we tripled his business over those years. And then, uh, you know, I went through a very old school apprenticeship program in the tax world. So I didn't know until years later that that's not how everybody gets into taxes, <laughs> and, you know, with an eye towards, um, not just, uh, in the tax world, we call it compliance versus versus planning. But what it really means is like, you know, do you go and talk to your tax person once a year? You say, here's my papers. They say, great. Put it in the computer, hand it over. Say, here's your tax return. You owe $5,000. You're getting a refund of $3,000, whatever the numbers are. Numbers are kind of, I don't want to say irrelevant, but that's actually not the, not the focus. On the compliance side, that means you're filing the forms that are, you are required to file by law and you're playing by the rules and all that kind of stuff. That all needs to be done. But the way I came up in the tax world is on the side of what can we do? Uh, just asking that question. It's like based on your situation, you know, you've got this business, you've got this real estate, you've got these kids, you know, whatever it is. Uh, we look at your situation holistically and figure out what are the strategies that we can apply ahead of time so that when it comes time to file the returns, you know, the following year, that things are in place in the right way. And the goal is to save money. Because it says here that the mission is to help my tribe of solopreneurs and small business owners get their quality of life back by saving their taxes. And that's true. Uh, over the last like two weeks, this is a new thing. I have broadened my mission. And this is kind of the realization that I've had that my, I mean, saving money, yes, absolutely. But the bigger mission is to actually use technology to defund the government. And that sounds scary to some people. And if you think the government's doing a bang up job, then this probably isn't the show for you. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a very small group of people who agree with uh, the way things are going. So what I want to do is I want to use the tools that we have available and apply, you know, effectively modern technology in a, in a world that is lagging far behind and use that to cut the legs out from under the federal government. Uh, by by taking out their tax rate. And that means more money in your pocket, more money in my pocket, more money in everybody's pocket. So that is that is the broader mission. I need to update uh, this mission here. But that's 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 how we go about that mission is, is through small business owners, solopreneurs, independent contractors, freelancers, gate workers, anything like that. 
investors. Um, basically, if you have anything in addition to or besides just a day job, then we can help a lot. And even if you have just a day job, a lot of times we can help a lot. But uh, yeah, we'll get into that as we go. So I love this quote. The quality of our questions determines the quality of our life. I think that's very true. And so my question becomes, what is the root problem with overpaying on your taxes? So there's two different levels of analysis here. So one is you personally, and the other is societally with the government. And that's kind of those two different missions that I was talking about. On the personal level, the problem is you're wasting 74 days of your life. So that's 20% of a year. 20% of 365 is 74. And I say that because if you wake up in the morning, presumably you put on clothes, you go out the door, or maybe you go to your basement like I do, and then you do your thing, whatever that is. And you provide value, you are you are providing a good or service to the marketplace that is freely choosing to buy your good or service in exchange for money. And we're all better off in those situations. You, The person who had the money gets the good or the service, they wanted that more than the money. You had the good or the service, and you wanted the money more than more than that. So everybody comes out better off in a win-win scenario. Now you go ahead and you do that all day, and you take whatever money you accumulated that day, and then you come home and you hand that money over to the government in the form of taxes. To me, that is a wasted day. Maybe you disagree, I don't know. Uh, but uh, most people I find are not super fans of, of paying more than they have to in the tax world. So if we take you from a 35% tax rate, when we add up everything, you know, the, the state income taxes, the federal income taxes, the payroll taxes, the self-employment taxes, the additional Medicare taxes, the net investment income taxes, if we take all those and we take you from 35% down to 15%, which is a thing that we do all the time, um, that's 20%. It's 20% of your, of your efforts that you're getting back for yourself. It's 20% of your time you're getting back for yourself. It's 20% of your money that you're, that you're getting back for yourself. And that translates to 74 days a year. Not 74 days once, but every year. Because as you as you implement that that plan and that structure that we create for you going forward, it, it compounds and works every year. So that's that's the problem, is that it's just that wasted life. And you're not wasting your entire life, but you're wasting 74 days. And I think one day is too many. So uh i know i said we're going to answer questions and everything but don't worry i have the answers to all tax questions and the answer is it depends, it depends. <laughs> yeah. and you know i know it sounds trite and uh you know, this, is the, this is the thing that lawyers say it's the thing that accountants say but it really is true it does depend uh and people say well what does it depend on well it depends on what it is that we're talking about because you know uh, what it comes down to is what we call facts and circumstances. Facts and circumstances mean that you know the totality of the situation depends not only on the actual events that happen, but also the context in which they happen and the intent behind them. So, my, you know, one of the great examples is cosmetic surgery. So, cosmetic surgery is not done because it's elective. So, if you get a nose job because you don't like the shape of your nose, then that's not a medical expense. If you get a nose job because you have breathing problems, then it is medical expense. But the nose job is the same. You know, if you uh, get a nose job because you were in a car accident and they have to reconstruct your face, deductible. Still the same surgery as the cosmetic surgery getting a nose job because you don't like your nose. So, you know, the event, uh, the actual surgery in that case is the same either way. But in some ways it's deductible, in some ways it's not, because it depends on the facts and circumstances around the event. Uh, but that's just one example. There's, there's a million of them. Uh, you know, we were talking to uh, a client yesterday, and, you know, we were going through our documents, and we were saying, okay, there's, there's this place in, I think it was Colorado, and there's another place in Michigan, and we're trying to, we're trying to work through. It's like, okay, what are these things? Uh, because if there are... If they're personal properties, it's treated one way, Schedule A kind of stuff. If they're investment properties, it's Schedule E. Totally different. Different things are deductible. So like your uh, your insurance on your primary residence, not deductible. Your insurance on your rental property, deductible. Same insurance, covers the same kind of stuff, 
but um, you know, it depends on the facts and circumstances. All right, so with all that, um, that's my preamble, I guess. Uh, so Serena, what do we have on the question front? So we have a partnership question. Uh -huh. uh, a client asks, how do you manage the allocation of profits and losses between partners when filing Form 1065? Does the structure of the partnership make it complicated? Uh, yes and no. So <laughs> that's, um, that's actually a really good question. That's one I don't, I don't hear very often. So in a partnership, you can actually do it however you want. Um, you can have, uh, you know, one part, one part, so there's three different allocations. So there's, there's profit, there's loss, and there's capital. And you can divvy that up in any way you, the partners choose. So um, usually what most people do is it just, it's just in line with your ownership percentages. So if it's a 50-50 partnership or maybe a 33, 33, 34, uh, then everybody puts in, you know, equally weighted stuff and they get out equally weighted profits, equally weighted losses. Uh, but there's no requirement to do that. You can you can do special allocations however you like, and uh, that is not true for other entities, but, but it is true for partnerships. So it could be that you know Joe puts in all the money, um, uh, Bob gets all the profits, and Sarah gets all the losses. So three different partners getting three different streams of tax flow. Um, so you know it's it's totally optional. Um, that, that will work with any partnership, essentially. Now, there are some caveats with that, in that uh, there's some edge case scenarios where if um, if you're going for like an, a penalty abatement and there's partnerships that are under 10 partners, then you only get the abatement if all of the allocations are in line with their ownership percentages. Uh, so you could violate that particular clause it's not it's not against the rules it just means you wouldn't get the get the penalty relief that you would seek under that particular provision but but overall you can you can do it however you like um the key thing with partnerships is that you want to spell out everything in the operating agreement so most people uh they have this idea they say we're going to go do this uh and i need my buddy and you know we're going to go into partnership together and everything's going to be great that's at the beginning uh, by the end, there's tears, there's heartache, there's lawsuits, you know, so <laughs> no, no partnerships end well, right? Uh, well, not no, but very few. And I ended up writing uh, an ebook on, um, on the 13 questions you need to answer before you go into partnership with somebody. And it's all these different scenarios, it's 13 different scenarios of, you know, things that can happen, things I have seen happen and have been part of myself in some cases. So I've been in, I don't know, four or five partnerships over the years. Two worked out okay. Uh, two, I guess it was four. Yeah, two worked out okay, two did not. And, you know, lessons I've learned, both personally being in those partnerships and then seeing clients go through all kinds of stuff. Uh, so there's 13, 13 scenarios to identify and then figure out a plan. And the reason for that is because by the time the thing happens, the event happens, um, and I'll give you a couple of them. So there's like the five D's. There's uh, death, divorce, drugs, disinterest, and disability. So if any of those happen, by the time the event happens, it is too late to make a plan. So like in the case uh, your partner dies, for example, there, obviously it's too late because there's nobody there to negotiate with to make a plan. Um, in the case of drugs, uh, if you know somebody turns into a drug addict, then you know, they're not in the talking kind of mood. You know, they're, uh, the, the example I go through in the book is um, there was this partnership that, that uh, they were doing advertising, kind of a special advertising model. And partner A uh, was a known drug addict, but was sober. Partner B uh, knew this and said, yeah, it'll be okay. <laughs> so one day, partner B goes in the office, all the computers are gone because partner A pawned them for drug money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, uh, it's things like that, right? And so you wanna, have, you wanna have a plan in place ahead of time so that when something happens, then you already have an action plan. So maybe there's an automatic buy-sell, maybe there's a shotgun agreement, maybe there's, um, you know, somebody forfeits their, their interest in the, in the uh, partnership. You know, there's all different what kind of ways you can do it. Uh, obviously you have to consult with a, with a uh, attorney in your state that is experienced with 
partnerships and uh, you know to make sure you're compliant with whatever state guidelines you have. But you know the, the point of the guide is to step you through like the thinking exercise. It's like, okay, what would we do if this were, ha were to happen? And now that we know that, we can you know talk with you know the relevant legal uh, expert to figure out the the compliant plan that will that will take care of that. So, but there's all different kinds of ways to, to handle the situations. So, uh, special allocations will be one of those. We want to know that going in, and so that you know if something goes bad. Because if things go well, it's fine. Everybody's happy. Actually, that's not even true. I've seen, I've seen plenty of partnerships make a lot of money, and then the partners start suing each other. It's like, well, I said I was going to do this. And you said you're going to do that, and you didn't do this. You know, all that kind of nonsense happens when uh, that happens it, with wild success, and it happens with wild failure. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see that evolve in on both ends of the spectrum. If things just kind of muddle along as expected, then yeah, I mean, you don't really have too many issues, but. Uh, you know that's that's rare. <laughs> so, uh, so I know that was a bit of a tangent, but uh, yeah, allocations you can do it however you want. Just spell it out ahead of time so that everybody knows what they're getting into and everybody's on the same page. Alrighty. So next question, Neil, is yeah. a Schedule E question. Uh -huh. um, someone wants to know if you own rental properties, what's a good way to track the expenses and deductions to report them on Schedule E? Um, use one of our templates. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Can I do this on the fly? What do you think? Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me bring it up in another window first so I don't reveal anything. Real estate uh, ledger. That's the one. All right. So, let me drag this over. Whoops. That's the wrong way. So this is why I should never do anything live. Okay, is that coming through? Okay. So, yeah, so as I know it's hard to see on the stream, but this is a, uh, a ledger that uh, template that we created, you know, for this exact question. And basically there's a couple different things. So one is a property list. So this is, you know, a lot of our clients have multiple properties. If you have just one, obviously there's just the one. Uh, but if you have multiples, then you know you just list out the the short name. So like, what do you want to refer to it as, and then the actual address. Category list. Uh, so these are categories of ex of activity, of monetary activity, uh, rental income, other income, accounting, association dues, cleaning, commissions, gardening, landscaping, insurance, legal, professional fees, licenses, permits, management fees, miscellaneous, interest expense. Painting, pest control, plumbing, electrical, repairs, supplies, appliances, property taxes, other taxes. Uh, we see more and more other taxes uh, with uh, short-term rentals as, as different jurisdictions are requiring like occupancy tax. Uh, telephone, utilities, wages, other property purchase, capital improvement. So this is a kind of basic listing, and there could be others depending on what you have going on. Um, again, facts and circumstances, but this will cover 95% of the situations. And then there's a ledger. So a ledger is just a list of transactions. So on January 30th, I bought this and it went to this subject property and the category was whatever, cleaning. You know, I paid a cleaner and the amount was X and the additional info is, you know, any kind of notes you want to put into it. And so you do that every time there's a transaction. Um, and then over here on the property summary, it will auto tabulate all that by category by property so it'll have if you have three properties it'll be three big categories and then within each each property it'll say income expense and all that kind of stuff and it'll auto summarize everything for you. so created this uh like i created a lot of my tools uh because people didn't want to do the full blown version of the work because if you want to do the full thing you actually set up you know a bookkeeping system like quickbooks or zero or wave or one of those and you actually record everything through that uh, most people don't want to do that. They don't want to take the extra expense. So this is a free way to do that. And it, uh, you know, it works great. Right. Uh, th the downside of it is that unlike those paid tools, this requires you to input all the stuff you know, yourself. So that's the trade-off. Uh, or, you know, just pay bookkeeping. They'll do it. Uh, we have plenty of clients that we do bookkeeping on rental properties for. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you are, if you have a rental property that is a self-contained business, and just like any other kind of business, 
you are required to keep records. And the government does not specify how you keep those records, but they specify that you do keep records. It's part of the difference between a business and a hobby, for example. Um, so you gotta keep, you gotta keep track somehow. Uh, a lot of people just operate out of their bank account and then dump a mess of paper on their account at the end of the year. And, uh, I don't, I don't love it when that happens. <laughs> I, I have built tools internally to help deal with that, but it's, it's still not fun. Uh, the, you know, if you, if you have an investment like that, take it seriously and, you know, do the work to, to treat it as such. I guess that's the, uh, that's the the short version but yeah if if you need it just you know let us know and uh we'll add we'll send you a copy of this template uh that reminds me serena we should add this to the explorers group and make sure that they have access to this because i don't think i put it on there so make a note of that somewhere okay do that all right um what else do we have going on so we have a 1031 exchange question. Oh, another um, state, sorry. Yeah. Uh, someone wants to know if you had any experience with Section 1031 exchange in real estate sure. investing to defer capital gains taxes. Absolutely. Uh, so Section 1031 is like kind exchanges. So just a recap for people who may not know. the uh, Before the Trump tax reform, this was a broader thing. But since the Trump tax reform, 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it is now only real estate. So what it is, is that you have some investment asset, like a rental property or a commercial property or something like that, and you sell it. And you say, I'm going to reinvest that money into the market, into the, into the same kind of market. So it's a like kind exchange. And so if I have rental property, I'm going to buy more commercial real estate of some type. It could be rental properties, could be commercial, could be whatever. It's just got to be, uh, uh, it's just got to be investment real estate that you don't live in. And if you do that, then the government says, okay, we're going to call this a wash. We're going to say you didn't actually take any money home for personal benefit, and therefore you're not going to have to pay tax. Uh, so the way this works is that you. Before you actually sell the property, I've, I've had people come to me like after the fact, say, well, can I do this? Like too late, you missed it. Before you sell the property, you coordinate with a type of person, a professional called a 1031 intermediary. And what they do is they are officially recognized as the person to hold the money so that you are not, you know, misallocating funds. And so you sell the property, it goes to the 1031 intermediary, you have a few months to identify your next property to buy, and then a few months more to actually close on that property. So let's say you sell a place for $500,000, that 500000 goes to the intermediary, and then you say, okay, I'm gonna use that 500000 to buy this property over here, or it could be multiple properties, just as a, as a portfolio, that works too. And um, you, Mr. Intermediary, send the money to this closing agent or this title attorney or whatever, and that will go towards you know, this, this uh, other investment property. As long as you do all that, tax-free. So what are the, what's the catch? Well, the catch is that when you buy, usually you do this in an upgrade. So if I sold the place for 500,000, I'm gonna be upgrading to, you know, something that's collectively at least worth a couple million bucks. And, you know, that, you know, this, this is all an incentive to keep the money at work in the economy. The catch, though, is that when you buy that $2 million property, when you go to sell it later on, your, your basis for gains uh, tax, capital gains tax calculations, is not the $2 million. It's whatever you bought the $500,000 property for way back when. And so your basis carries forward unchanged. And if you do this a couple times, you end up with this enormous portfolio with almost no cost basis. And so if it, it kind of makes you feel trapped a little bit in that, well, I deferred these gains, deferred these gains, deferred these gains. If I want to take the gains now, it's such a huge tax hit that most people end up you know, paralyzed by that. So um, there are strategies to deal with this. So strategy number one is installment sales, where you don't take it all up front and you spread out the gain over time and you spread out the pain of the tax over time. Um, there's the old just don't sell right um this is where you just continue to refinance uh and get capital out that way but you know that's not a taxable event because it's a loan you got to pay it back um 
And then there's a couple of the more exotic stuff, which I don't want to go into at this point. But that's basically it. Either you keep it forever, or you keep growing the portfolio forever. That's the buy, borrow, die uh, approach, which works great. Um, but you'll never you never fully capture the value out of that portfolio. Uh, but you get cash flow along the way, and you get tax benefits, so that the um, uh, you're, you're effectively creating tax free income for you know however long you own that portfolio. And then you die, and then you leave it to your heirs, and they get a step up in basis, meaning that their cost basis gets reset on the day of inheritance. Um, so yeah, so that, that's what a 1031 exchange is. We've certainly done them, um, uh, in the old days, you used to be able to do them with, with, like I said, a wider variety of assets. Uh, so people will try to do businesses. So I have a business, I sell a business, I use that money to buy another business. Uh, but that, as of 2017, that got cut off and it's only real estate now. Now, Tax Cut and Jobs Act is expiring in 2026, and, uh, we will see who wins this election as to what happens there. Because if Trump gets elected, then uh, he has campaigned on the promise to make the Tax Cut and Jobs Act permanent. And uh, obviously, if Kamala gets elected, then not, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we will see what happens in about a month. And, uh, you know, either way. Well, so, so I, I, I shouldn't say that. So if Trump gets elected... He still needs an act of Congress in order to pass that legislation to to make the Tax Cut and Jobs Act permanent. If Kamala gets elected, she does she just has to do nothing because it's already scheduled to expire. So uh, in that way, there there are some road bumps either way, depending on which side of the aisle you fall on. But uh, you know, it's something that we will pay attention to and let you know as that deadline comes closer. Uh, but yeah, that's that's some other things we certainly do them. Um, it's, uh, you know, you fill out a special form on the tax return to, to document the asset you gave up, the asset you acquired, and then the math behind everything. And yeah, it works right. All righty. Awesome. Awesome. And so Neil, we have a crypto question. Okay. Um, so someone said, I invest in crypto. How does the taxes work for cryptocurrency investments? <laughs> it's complicated. Uh, so. So here's the thing. There is no legislation anywhere that says how crypto is to be taxed. It ha just does not exist. What happened in 2013 was the IRS planted a flag in the sand and said that we are going to treat crypto as property for tax purposes. And everybody said, okay, you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, because nobody knew what it was. And also crypto has evolved significantly since then. So, uh, Two really important things happened since then. So one is the development of DeFi. So DeFi didn't really exist uh, in, in its current form back then. And the other is uh, the Chevron deferral doctrine was overturned. This That just happened last year. So before the Chevron deferral overturn, uh, which I can't remember the name of the court case off the top of my head right now, but um, basically what, what that doctrine was was that if there was an ambiguity in legislation, the courts would defer to the relevant uh, administrative experts. So in the case of taxation, that'd be the IRS. So since there is no legislation regarding crypto, the courts would, would just kind of look to the IRS and say, hey, how do we interpret this you know, stuff? And the IRS says, it's property. And the court says, great. You know, and then people go on their way. Um, that no longer exists. Uh, as of last year, or this past year, I guess. So now it's sort of completely up in the air as far as how crypto should be taxed. So there is there is a sensibility in which it is property. So if you are treating crypto like a stock and you're buying and selling it on an exchange, then yeah, you're just going to have regular capital gains. Uh, that part is fine. Uh, it's the same as if you were trading in, you know, you buy and sell iPhones, right? Um, so, you know, if you, you have a cost of goods and you sell it and then you have a profit, hopefully, and, you know, maybe you have a loss, whatever the case is, you know, you calculate it all up. If you hold it for more than a year, it's long term. If it's less than a year, short term, fine. The, the tricky part gets into the more complicated things like with smart contracts and DeFi and all these other things. So if you read the IRS um, papers on crypto, they say a couple different things. So one is that in the... 
uh, uh, in the event of a token exchange, that is a taxable event. So if I have Ethereum and I trade it for Bitcoin, for example, whatever the market value of that exchange is, that is a sale and I sold my Ethereum. It doesn't matter that I received Bitcoin. I, I, I sold my Ethereum and the market value of that was some price based on the Bitcoin that I received. And there's external markets that, that can you can calculate that price. And so I have an event, a taxable event, and I have whatever basis my, for trading purposes on that Ethereum, and so I have a gain or a loss. Okay, fine. Uh, in smart contracts, that's not what happens. In smart contracts, I have my Ethereum, I lock it into a smart contract that I no longer own, I no longer have what's called dominion and control of that coin. And I receive in exchange a another token, uh, which again, IRS. If you if you read the FAQs on the on the IRS website about crypto, you'll see that if you exchange one token for another, that's an event. But, so I received this I received this uh, this smart contract receipt token, which has no price, has literally zero. And so, you know, I've I've you know worked through the the logic on this, and effectively, you sold your Ethereum for for nothing, in the hope that in the future you get back more. Right. And so, um, you know, you you traded one token for a zero price token. And then when you go to redeem that token, uh, that smart contract token, then you're going to receive whatever it is. So uh, this happens with liquidity pools, for example. So I take two tokens, Ethereum and Tether, let's say I contribute them to this liquidity pool. I receive a liquidity pool token in exchange. And then I hope later on I can exchange that liquidity pool token back for more Ethereum and more Tether, uh, or more of one or the other, but the total aggregate value uh, is is higher. Um, so, you know, this kind of operation immediately complicates things dramatically. And that is just one type of operation. Here's another type of operation. There's a bridge. So a bridge is where I have, let's just stick with Ethereum for a second. There's an the Ethereum coin, there's the Ethereum blockchain. If I exchange my, let's say tether, uh, my tether on the on the Ethereum blockchain, and I want it instead on the Avalanche blockchain, I use a bridging service. So I send my tether to the bridge. The bridge then sends me tether on Avalanche on the other end after some number of processing uh, steps. But those are two different tokens. So what really happened was I sold, I or I gave away my tether on ethereum and i received as a gift maybe um, the tether on avalanche and you know so how you account for all these things is subjective um additionally there was an issue with staking so there was a court case uh last i checked it was still it was still in limbo uh it'd been going on for a while uh, i think it was the johnson case in i want to say the D tennessee uh, I'm blanking on the details at the moment, but basically they staked their one of their coins, uh, Tezos or something like that, and they got staking rewards. And initially they filed a tax return saying that that staking rewards was income following the IRS uh, FAQs, basically, they, where they modeled out a couple different scenarios. And according to the IRS, you stake something, you get rewards, that's active income, or that's, that's income, not necessarily active income. And... So they made they made an amendment to their tax return, and they said, "Well, wait a second, that's not really true, uh, because if you take a if you take a cake and you're a baker, um, it, you know you don't pay income tax on the flour and the salt and the sugar and the you know the eggs. You only pay tax when you combine those things into a new product and then sell it in the form of a cake." So their argument was that staking rewards are not income until you sell them. And then when you sell them, then you have a taxable event. And so what was really interesting about the case was that they filed the amendment, the IRS approved the amendment, and then the, they said, that it was a married couple, they said, well, we want to go to court. And uh, last, I, last I saw, it was still had not finalized anything. But, um, you know, it's definitely, it's, it's an argument, and it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of internal consistency there. So, you know, how do you tax all these things that are not just straight buying and selling you know you gotta you gotta pick pick something that makes logical sense and be consistent about it that's really the answer 
Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's complicated, <laughs> and there's there's no there's no rules, there's no uh, legislation, there's no anything, there's no court cases really um, that uh, that have established any real precedent. So it's it's kind of wild west times when it comes to crypto. So the way I look at it, and I'll talk to clients about it, is I will kind of take the property angle of things, and I will say, okay, what actually happened on a blockchain level? Not what do you think happened, but like like physically what tokens went where, and um, you know what was under your dominion and control and what was not. So I'm pretty active in a game called Splitterlands, and the um, you know that it's a crypto based uh, web game, and while you have tokens inside of the game, they are they are not in your dominion and control. Like Splinterlands could just run off into the wilderness somewhere and take all your stuff because they have control of the assets while it's inside of the game ecosystem. That's true of most things, uh, most games and most of these smart contracts. That's how rug pulls happen because they have dominion and control and you don't. So um, keeping that paradigm in mind, then you have to say, okay, well, if I've relinquished dominion and control, if I've given up direct ownership, then that is a sale of some kind. And what did I get in exchange? In most cases, you got nothing. And so those are actual sales for 100% losses. And then on the flip side, when you redeem those things, those are 100% gains. So that's that's typically the framework we're working in. And um, But yeah, you got to look at the specifics. There was another council opinion by the IRS put out back in March or April talking about NFTs. And what, what that said was that you have to do a look-through analysis, meaning that if you bought an NFT that represents a piece of artwork and like a fractionalized Monet painting or something, then what you're really owning is, you know, one one thousandth or whatever of that piece of artwork. And then what, how is that thing treated? Is that a collectible? Is that a, a piece of property? Is it a charitable thing? You know, so you have to look through the NFT into what it represents. And that's a direct contradiction to what the IRS said earlier about, you know, virtual currencies being uh, property. So again, Wild West, um, just you know, pick uh, pick something that pick a way of treating it that makes sense and be consistent about it, and you know, we'll see where it goes. So, I know that's a not a very satisfactory answer, but that's kind of where the state of the of the world is at the moment with crypto taxation. Yeah, crypto is very complicated. It's very complicated, and and the other <laughs> thing is that like if you're an active uh, trader, you, you you might have a hundred thousand transactions. In a year and that's impossible to reconcile so uh there are software products that attempt to but none of them really work so it's it's a giant mess all righty understood uh looks like we have a hiring of someone's kid so okay. um a client wants to know if i hire my kid how does that process work and how much should i pay them right and can i set them up a retirement account after i hire them well, absolutely. Yes. Um, let's start with the last part first. <laughs> so uh, I love, love, love hiring kids as a tax strategy. Not only does it create, um, not only does it create tax deductions for the parent, which is great. Uh, it also imparts all of the lessons of money uh, to the kids at an early age, uh, which is fantastic. And it also, if you do the retirement angle, sets them up for huge success later on. Um, so yes, fundamentally what you do is you, you give your kid an actual job. So what do I mean by actual job? There's gotta be actual work. Uh, you, you want to have job descriptions. You want to have, um, uh, you, you want to do like, you know, figure out what the salary rate for that or the hourly rate for that job is. Um, uh, so like, for example, I have a 10 year old. She does my mail. She opens my mail, she scans it, and she shreds it, right? <laughs> and I looked up in my particular market, when I look around for that particular type of job, it pays about $19 an hour. And so I pay her $19 an hour. And, you know, we keep timesheets and all the kind of stuff. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta go through with all the formalities. You have to actually file a W-2. You have to actually register with the state as far as, you know, having a payroll account and all those kinds of things. So, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the mechanical how you do it. Uh, 
once they have a W-2, now that is earned income. And once you have earned income, you are eligible to contribute to retirement accounts like IRAs. So you could pay your kid. Uh, in 2024, the standard deduction for anybody is, for a single person, is $14,600. So nobody is going to pay tax on the first $14,600 of income, uh, at least for income taxes. There are other taxes. There's Social Security tax, there's Medicare tax, there's unemployment tax, and all this kind of stuff. If, if you set it up correctly, then the, the payment to the kid as the employer and the reception of the money as the employee are both tax-free for all those things. Uh, so there's, you know, you gotta, you gotta consult with somebody to set it up right because there's entity restrictions and how this is all done. So, um, so fundamentally though, you, you set the kid up on payroll, you pay them fourteen thousand six hundred as as a max. Then you're not paying any income tax. You're not paying any social security tax. You're not paying any Medicare tax. You're not paying any unemployment tax. So total total tax free transfer, and then that creates a deduction of fourteen thousand six hundred dollars, and that's going to reduce the owner, uh, you know, the parent in this case, uh, the parent's income by fourteen six, which is fantastic. If you want to maximize the IRA or the maximize the deduction and use the IRA. Then you could, you know, the contribution limit in 2024, $7,000. So you could pay them fourteen six plus 7000 so twenty-one six, and still have it entirely tax-free. And, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to build the job in such a way that they're actually, you know, providing meaningful work and all the kind of stuff's got to justify that amount. But if you can, and a lot of people can, um, especially as the kids get older. So this, this works between the ages of 8 and 17. That's key, key parameters. So between ages of 8 and 17, they can be gainfully employed. And the later stages of that, say 14 to 17, somewhere in there, um, they can do a lot of real work for you. And so if you have your own business, then have your kids do your social media. Because uh, one, they're better at it than you are. And two, you can work it into the strategy. And three, it's a highly paid job. It's a, it's a great skill to have. So if you do all that and you you know, pay your kids $21,000 a year, then you get a deduction of $21,000 on your income. They get the $21,000 in their pocket, and then $7,000 of that goes into the IRA. And then that's left, assuming they can leave it alone, that can grow for 50 years. So two, two elements with that. So one is that there is a tax credit coming in 2027, which is going to reward low-income people who contribute to retirement plans. So if you make $21,000, you're low income. And, you know, the, the, the government will give you up to a thousand bucks cash into your retirement account as a matching kind of, uh, uh, matching kind of contribution. So you could do this, put in 7,000, get an extra thousand on top in your IRA. And then, you know, by the time 50 years goes around, you know, it's going to be a few million bucks. So really, really powerful. The, the pushback I get from parents is that, well, I don't want to pay my kid $14,000. I don't want to pay my kid $5,000, <laughs> right? And so here's the thing. You're spending the money anyway, right? Kids aren't free, right? Kids are crazy expensive. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, there's there's the toys, there's the lessons, there's the camps, there's the clothes and whatever, you know, it never ends. And so now, instead of coming out of your pocket to, to pay for all those things, they're paying for it. So, you know, there's been a lot of news off and on over the last couple of years about, you know, people deducting private school tuition, which you're not supposed to do, right? That's a, that's a, uh, that'd be a taxable perk. So you can't, you can't write it off. However, if you pay your kids $14,000 because they do actual work worth $14,000 and then they pay for their private school, then that's fine. That still works. So the math ends up ending, ending up the same, but you do it in a permissible way versus an impermissible way. So again, facts, facts and circumstances make a difference. Um, so, you know, I, I, I can't imagine a, kid, a parent paying less than 10 grand for a kid in 2024, just across the board. doesn't matter how much you make, honestly. Uh, I, I don't see that happening. But, you know, maybe, maybe you're super frugal and you only spend eight. Okay, so eight. Take that number. That's fine. Uh, you still get a tax deduction on it, and you still get to impart the lessons of money, and you still get to set your kid up for success long term by using uh, the retirement accounts. So, very powerful strategy for the long term. I mean, 
20 grand, it's not going to make or break anything in, in this year, but by setting them up for that long-term success, it's, it's really powerful. Um, so yeah, definitely do it. Uh, if it applies to you and you know, lots of people have kids. So, um, it applies to a lot of people. Awesome. So Neil, we have a dust to roll question. Uh -huh. So a client wants to know if you can tell them more about the gusta rule, how it works, and is it true that it's 14 days that you rent your home to yourself for your business? Not to yourself, no. Um, okay. So, yeah, so the, the, the way the gusta rule works, and it's called the gusta rule because it was uh, it was slipped in uh, in 1976 into one of the tax legislations by a bunch of people who live around the golf course in Augusta, Georgia. That's where they have the master's golf tournament. So a bunch of rich guys who live in big houses around the, the, the course, they want to rent out their houses during the tournament and not pay taxes. So the great thing about this is that I've looked at the, you know, the legislation and it's 95 words, this, this whole thing. And if you look back at the legislative history of it, you know, they keep notes of the, the committee meetings and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so I, I look through the notes and then this this clause just appears one day and it's never talked about at all <laughs> it's hilarious so uh, the way it works is that you could rent out your primary residence or your primary dwelling is the way it's turned in the, in the code a uh for uh no more than or uh sorry for less than 15 days so 14 or less basically during the course of the year and you and that income from that rental activity is excludable from your taxable income meaning that you could take your house, put it on Airbnb, as long as you rent it 14 days or less during the year, tax-free. So that's great. Um, also, part of the 95 words is you're not allowed to take you're not allowed to take normal deductions that you would have with investment real estate uh, if you're also not declaring the income as part of your taxable income, which I think is fair. Okay, so I don't have to pick up the income. I also don't get to take expenses. Fine, we're even, Stephen. The where the so that's 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 part one of the strategy. Part two of the strategy is that, okay, what happens if I rent out my primary dwelling to my business? Uh, so this is one of those areas where you have to make sure that you are a distinct entity from a tax perspective uh, for, than your business. And so the, um, uh, so like Schedule C filers, which is, there's 29 million Schedule Cs filed every year. And those people cannot use this strategy because it's just you're you're when you file a Schedule C, you're saying this is an alternate view of myself from a tax perspective, and therefore you can't self deal, uh, so you cannot rent to yourself. Uh, so you're you're from a tax perspective, your company has to be different than you. So that's one thing. And so now you have your your business, assuming you set it up right, uh, renting from you, and you are able to exclude the income and the business gets a deduction. So you double dip on that. So that's that's the real real magic of how it works. Now, in order to be a viable business deduction for the business, there has to be a business purpose for this. And this is where people screw it up. So, you know, uh, what's this little SNL line, like, hear me now, listen to me later. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a business purpose for the rental. So what we do is we've turned this into what we call the summit strategy sessions. And we guide you through or guide our clients through, uh, you know, having an actual business management meeting. And this accomplishes a couple different things all at the same time. <laughs> so one, most small business people are got into small business, whatever it is they do, because they're great at doing a thing. So like, you know, I do taxes, right? Doing taxes is a different thing than owning a business that provides tax preparation services or tax planning services or tax advisory services or bookkeeping or any of these other things that we do. So if you are a great artist and you sell graphic, you know, design stuff, that is different than owning a business that sells graphic design services. If you are a, uh, I don't know, so you know, what, what, what's a job that people have? Uh, Put it on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so a job would be maybe like an e-commerce business. Sure. 
So, you know, if you have an e-commerce business, that's different than, you know, going in and buying and selling stuff on eBay or Amazon, right? Because the, the business of providing a good or a service encompasses a whole lot more stuff than just doing the thing. And so the, um, so because most small business people don't really have any real training in business management or business operations, you know, what we encourage them to do is to actually take a day, you know, yes, use the tax strategy for sure, get the most, you know, bang for your buck out of that as possible, but then actually have management meetings with yourself and do the things like reviewing your books, forecasting out financials, um, uh, seeing what the trends are in your business. And then you're able to actually run a better business because of that. Because, you know, most small businesses are just terribly run. So I'll give you an example. Right now, I'm sitting in my basement. We, we are having water problems. And so we had a company come out that does waterproofing for basements. And uh, the sales guy came out and he looked at the thing and says, okay, we could do this, that, and the other, and it's going to be $30,000. And we said, okay, <laughs> not really excited about the price, but we do need this done. Um, so we're, we're, we, we bit the bullet and, you know, signed the contract and all that kind of stuff. They told us, uh, one set of facts and circumstances. And what is actually happening is a different set of facts and circumstances, because even though that's a fair, I mean, as far as small business goes, they're fairly large. They've got a whole, they've got different crews and there's, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an office and there's sales teams and there's, you know, operations people. So, you know, there's probably 50 people involved in this business and yet they still can't get their act together and coordinate and provide the good or the service as promised, right? So they told us it was going to be on one date. It's ended up being on another date. We, they told us it was going to be done in this way. Guy comes out and says, like, oh, we can't do it that way. We got to do it this other way. And so it's just, it's just constantly a, a battle that's just been going on for like two weeks now. So my point there is that even really big small businesses still have these same problems with you know, management and operations. So a solopreneur or somebody who has a small team, they are, they have these problems, you know, magnified 10 times. And so taking that time once a month to actually review your books, to see what's going on in your business, to just stop and think rather than being so busy in the do, 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 will actually help you beat your competition, make more money, and just improve the economy overall, which is all tax incentives that exist are all ostensibly created in order to improve economic activity. So like the 1031 exchange we talked about earlier, it's there to keep it to, as an incentive to keep your money in the markets so that you're providing, you know, housing or commercial space for people. Um, you know, if, if you're given a deduction for something by the government, it's because you're doing a thing that the government wants. And so, you know, when we have this setup, we are creating better businesses, which improves the economy overall. And so the government has less to do, which is, which is the goal for all of us. Um, but yeah, so bottom line, use the strategy, but do it right. Actually have a business purpose to the beating. Do that by managing your business better. Document the whole thing. We've got a whole process for it. And we'll come out richer because you took advantage of the tax deductions and richer because you are running a better business and richer because you are less stressed because you know what's going on in your business. So that is uh, three ways that the uh, Augusta strategy done right through the summit strategy sessions. It can make you richer. All right. So we're coming up on the end of the hour. Now, normally, uh, at least for the last several weeks, I have had a particular slide at the end here. This one's going to be different. So on Thursday, at 7 p.m. Uh, August, or not August, October 10th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, we're having a workshop. It's the end of year workshop where what we're going to do is we're going to step through uh, everybody's, it's, it's, it's not just me talking at people. We're going to be, we're, everybody's going to get a copy of a worksheet. We're going to step through it, how to fill it out, how to take your income that you have year to date, how to project it out into the rest of the year so that you know what your tax position is now rather than waiting till the end of the year and just seeing what happened. Because once we figure out where you are, then we can figure out where to go. So, you know, in order to, to make the plan to attack that tax liability, we have to then, we have to first know what it is. 
So the end of your workshop, we're going to go through that, and then I'm going to cover 13 different strategies in five different categories of tax strategy so that you can start to attack this number. Now, not all 13 is going to apply to you, but there's going to be at least, I'd say at least three are going to apply to everybody. You know, different three, but at least three can apply to everybody. So uh, we were charging for this, uh, but I, with my realization about my mission to uh, use technology to defund the government, I decided to make it free, so we re refunded everybody who had paid. And uh, now you just go to taxsherpa.com slash EOY, which is end of year, and that'll take you there. You just fill in your email and all that kind of stuff, and you'll be registered uh, to get all of the Zoom info, because we're just going to get on Zoom as, like, as just a regular call. And it's going to be fantastic, I think. Um, most people go through the year from a tax perspective just asleep. And then they wake up in February or March. Some people wake up in October and freak out. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few of those. Um, and, you know, they say, oh, you know, here's my stuff. What do I do? It's like, well, what, what you should have done is work with us the past year. Like, uh, I won't go into it. But um, we have people that we've been trying, literally trying to get on the phone for a year. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, plan ahead. That's the whole thing. You know, take take the hour that's gonna that that the workshop's gonna be. Come join me on Zoom. I'll walk you through it. It's it's not that complicated, and you know it's it's not you know a perfect system either. But it'll get you in the ballpark of of where you are, and then you can start to make a plan as far as okay, I see this number at the end. I don't like that number. I want it to be less. And now we can talk about how to make it less, and then we can we'll go over all the different strategies. Not all of them, but a lot of the different strategies that. Um, you can use in order to make that number smaller and defund the government. All right, so that's all I got for this week. If you are coming to the workshop, I'll see you Thursday. Otherwise, we'll see you next week here, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, and uh, I hope everybody has a good week. All right. Yeah. Catch you um, later. Okay.